Firefly's planning to copy Starship, China flies another rocket hopper but crashes on landing, a new crew has returned from the International Space Station, and yes, there's even more SpaceX and FAA drama. We'll cover all that and a whole lot more this week in Spaceflight. New Glenn has finally breathed fire for the first time, but it's a bit different than how you might think. Normally when we use that expression, we tend to think about the first stage being fired up, but instead, this was with the second stage. This second stage, meant for the first flight of New Glenn, was rolled to Launch Complex 36 a few weeks ago. Since then, teams have been trying to get to this static fire for a while, and, well, let's just say that doing something like this for the first time is not a walk in the park. The test, which lasted 15 seconds according to Blue, is the first time that any of New Glenn's stages was tested in fully integrated configuration. Prior to this, Blue had tested the second stage engines and tanks separately, but now they've finally been tested while integrated. The pad itself was also tested, with the ground systems being put through their paces, loading the stage with propellants and other fluids, as well as activating the water deluge system. Now, if you're wondering why Blue would test this second stage at the launch site instead of moving it to some remote stand within its Texas test site, well, it's because this is certainly not a small vehicle. At 7 meters wide and more than 20 meters long, New Glenn's second stage is one of the largest rocket upper stages in the world, larger than even the Saturn V's S4B stage. So with that taken into consideration, it makes sense to try and test the stage as close to the factory as possible, and using its own launch site is the best way to solve that issue. Something similar is also true for the first stage of New Glenn, which is also 7 meters in diameter, but even longer than the second stage at nearly 60 meters long. With this second stage test fire completed, we now expect that Blue Origin will move the first stage out to the launch site for a similar round of tests prior to the rocket's first flight. Dave Limp, Blue Origin CEO, recently shared some pictures of this first flight booster, which has been named So You're Telling Me There's a Chance. The name of this is, of course, not just a movie reference, but also a reference to the fact that this first flight will feature a landing attempt of the booster on Blue Origin's drone ship Jacqueline out in the ocean. Trying this on a first flight would be a first for any rocket, so a failure is not out of the question, but as for success, there's definitely a chance. Now, if you didn't get enough drama last week with the FAA finding SpaceX and then SpaceX blowing back with the letter to Congress, sit on down, because there is a whole lot more that came out this week. On September 24th, FAA Administrator Michael Whitaker appeared before Congress to participate in a hearing of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. The hearing's purpose was to discuss the implementation of corrective safety actions at Boeing's aviation sector. The hearing was literally called Implementation on Boeing's Comprehensive Action Plan. However, despite the fact that this hearing was about Boeing, Representative Kevin Kiley, a Republican representing California's 3rd Congressional District, asked Administrator Whitaker about SpaceX's Starship rocket and the delays incurred with its fifth flight, as well as the fines imposed to SpaceX in the last week. So, so how about this delay? Are you saying that the delay of Starship is for safety reasons? The, that, the, well, the civil penalty matter wasn't delayed. They launched without a permit. The, the delay of the Starship had to do with SpaceX filing an application and not disclosing that they were in violation of Texas and, and federal law on some matters, and that's a requirement to get a permit. So, so my question though is, is it a safety issue? Is that why it's being delayed? Uh, it, I, I think it is, it is, I think launching these rockets is a safety issue into the NAS. And I think it's, it's uh, a situation that, that requires the same level of safety management and safety culture that we're working to implement at Boeing needs to also exist with commercial space. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with you on that. I'm saying are the reasons for this delay, which is you know moving the launch back from what was previously communicated, are the reasons for the delay safety related? Well, the first reason of delay was that um, SpaceX <clears throat> failed to provide an updated sonic boom analysis. So there was a 30 day delay due to that. Uh, and then the latest delay was their failure to comply with Texas law, which is a prerequisite to getting a, a, a launch permit. The questions and the back and forth between them was picked up by SpaceX and the company posted a letter, apparently sent to this representative and not to the FAA administrator by the looks of it, in which it claims that the administrator's statements on the delays and fines were incorrect. The company lists a series of points in which it tries to prove the falsehood of his statements. This, of course, has now thrown everyone again into a debate, and even more drama has resulted, including SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk calling for the administrator to resign. Needless to say, this has become quite the hot topic. 
And the best way to deal with the hot topic, of course, is to watch our own spicy live show, The Flame Trench, which will no doubt feature some heated debates about this topic much more in depth. So is there any path to moving up that launch? Um, complying with the regulations would be the best path. Firefly Aerospace is planning to copy SpaceX's Starship, but not in the way you think. NSF's Tyler Gray was able to visit the company's test site facilities in Briggs, Texas just a few days ago, and during the visit, he got an interview with Miles Gray, chief engineer of Firefly's medium launch vehicle, often referred to as just MLV. Also during the visit, Tyler was able to take a look at the MLV development tank being tested at the site. The test article, dubbed Shorty because of its shorter legs than a regular MLV first stage, will allow engineers to validate the manufacturing process of the MLV tanks without needing to build a complete first stage. Also at the site, on a separate test stand, was a new Miranda development engine, which technicians were preparing for an upcoming firing. Once in flight, seven engines like this one will be powering Firefly's MLV rocket. That rocket, like many of the upcoming rockets in the medium lift range, will be partially reusable and will feature a first stage that will perform a propulsive landing for recovery. But what's definitely unlike other medium lift rockets being developed right now is the recovery method. According to Miles, Firefly won't be designing MLV to carry landing legs, but instead it will be caught on the ground at the end of its landing burn. Now this is more like SpaceX's Super Heavy, which will also be caught near the ground at the end of its landing burn. Miles acknowledged that the idea is certainly very similar, but said that the company is still looking at at least three different options, each with a varying degree of accuracy needed for the booster to land. While he never specified what these options would use in terms of hardware, he did describe them in terms of what would be needed from either booster or ground systems in order to carry out the booster recovery. One of these options would require the booster to be smart and essentially try to land as accurately as possible, but the ground systems would be mostly passive with no action needed and would be simple to build and design. On the other extreme, you could have a booster with an accuracy of only about 30 meters, but some very smart ground system hardware that can compensate for it and then end up grabbing the booster. An intermediate solution would be for both booster and ground systems to be designed such that one can adapt to the other, requiring only an accuracy of a meter or so, something closer to Starship's chopstick system. In order for the booster to be caught, Firefly is weighing whether to use the vehicle's own grid fins as resting points or load points that attach to the same location as the grid fins, also very similar to SpaceX's Super Heavy. Being able to carry out this type of recovery means that the booster will not be landing downrange on a barge and will instead return back to land for recovery. This means that there will be no Firefly Navy, as Miles puts it, although he acknowledged that perhaps later in the future they could revise that and change the plans. It's precisely because of this need to return back to land after stage separation that Firefly wants to test the flip maneuver on the first flight of MLV. After stage separation, the first stage is planned to flip quickly in order to reduce the time it takes for it to start its boost back burn. Such a quick flip would produce sloshing in the propellant tanks, among many other complications, so getting the chance to study all of this very early on will be key for Firefly as it walks toward booster reusability for MLV. A new spaceflight company, Longshot Space, has emerged this week, and they're trying to do something kinda wild. The company wants to send things into space and into orbit by shooting them out of a cannon at high speeds. Yeah, right? <laughs> it sounds a bit crazy, but they've already not only been granted a $2 million contract from the Air Force, but have also already conducted subscale testing of its launch system. The company has so far been able to demonstrate firing projectiles up to Mach 4.6 and plans to scale this up to speeds reaching Mach 7. Now, this isn't the first time a company has come up with a new and unconventional way to launch stuff into orbit. Remember Spin Launch and their centrifuge launch system? These types of alternative launch solutions obviously have a lot of downsides. Both have a sudden high acceleration as their method of launch, which means no humans would be launched on these types of systems. Both also encounter the Earth's atmosphere as soon as they exit the system, so they'll need to be heavily protected against aerodynamic heating. It'll definitely be interesting to see whether any of this actually eventually becomes feasible or not, but only time will tell. NASA's Europa Clipper has been fueled for launch. The agency confirmed this week that its next flagship planetary mission has been loaded with the 6,067.6 .6 pounds of propellant, 
or 2,752.2 kilograms, that it will use during its mission to Jupiter's icy moon Europa. Ahead still remains the integration of the probe with its payload adapter and its encapsulation inside of its Falcon Heavy fairing for the mission. Over the last few weeks, SpaceX teams have been modifying the transporter erector at Launch Complex 39A to configure it for Falcon Heavy. It's expected that this transporter will next roll back to the horizontal integration facility in order to start the integration of Falcon Heavy with the ground systems. As of recording, the launch is still on track for October 10th at 1631 UTC, and you can bet that, as always, we'll be covering it live as it happens. Last week, we had the successful hop test of a Chinese rocket. But this week, we unfortunately have a less successful one. This time, it was from Deep Blue Aerospace and its Nebula 1 rocket. The vehicle, fitted with three Thunder R1 engines, lifted off on September 22nd at 5.40 UTC from the company's test site located at Ejian Banner in Inner Mongolia. The vehicle ascended under the power of all three engines and then shut down the outer two near Apogee, performing its descent only under the power of the center engine. However, when it was already close to the landing pad, the rocket seemed to hover and then shut down the engine while it was still in the air. This resulted in a crash and subsequent fireball. According to the company, the vehicle's center engine had an issue with its throttling and was unable to properly land. The company suffered a very similar issue with an earlier prototype called Nebula 1M, which flew back in 2022 on a one kilometer altitude hop. In that instance, instead of stopping close to the ground, it just hit the ground faster than it probably should have. With all the data gathered from this test, Deep Blue is now aiming to repeat the hop test later this year and hopefully completing it with a soft landing. Now let's take a look at all the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off on September 20th, we had the launch of a Changzheng 2D from China. On board were six satellites for the Zhilin-1 Wideband Constellation, which is a constellation of commercial Earth observation satellites. These latest satellites can image an area 150 kilometers wide at a resolution of half a meter per pixel. The satellites were launched into a sun-synchronous orbit from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center, with liftoff occurring at 4.11 UTC. Just a few hours later, another mission was launched from China. This time, a Kuaizhou 1A lifted off from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The payload on this mission were four satellites for the Tianqi Internet of Things communication constellation. The other satellites in this constellation have hitched a ride to low Earth orbit on many different rockets, and the last few of which were flown last year on Galactic Energy's Series 1. That same day, we also had a Starlink mission from Vandenberg. On September 20th at 1350 UTC, Falcon 9 took to the Californian skies with 20 satellites in its fairing. Seven of these were regular V2 mini satellites, and the other 13 had direct-to-cell capabilities. The booster flying this mission was B1075, and it completed its 13th flight by successfully landing on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. And if you've set your clock to universal time, there was one more launch that very same day. The fourth mission on September 20th took off from New Zealand at 2301 UTC. On this flight, Electron lifted five satellites into low Earth orbit for the French company Canace. This mission was called Canace Killed the Radio Star, with a T at the end of radio, because these satellites are part of an Internet of Things, or IOT, constellation. This was the second launch for Canace, with three more to come, as the constellation is planned to have a total of 25 satellites. This flight lifted off from Pad 1 at Rocket Lab's launch complex in New Zealand, but it didn't actually launch on its first attempt. If you remember, this launch was originally scheduled to take off a few days earlier, but that attempt was aborted shortly after engine ignition. The cause was an issue with the ground support equipment, which is interesting because the launch pad hadn't been used since July of 2022. But whatever caused the abort, it didn't stop Electron on the second attempt. This week, we also had the return of Soyuz MS-25. The capsule undocked from the International Space Station's Prashal module on September 23rd at 8.36 Universal Time. Returning from space were Roscosmos cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chub, as well as NASA astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Kononenko not only commanded the capsule upon its return, but he had also been the station commander since April. Before his departure from the ISS, he handed over command to NASA astronaut Sunita Williams, who became in charge of the station for the second time. A few hours after undocking, the Soyuz landed on the steppes of Kazakhstan at 11.59 UTC. And, shortly after landing, Dyson was even given roses by her former commander, cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky. In March, he had commanded the MS-25 spacecraft on the way up to the station with Dyson on board, alongside Belarusian cosmonaut Marina Vasilevskaya. But Novitsky and Vasilevskaya returned on Soyuz MS-24 a few weeks later. 
This vehicle swap also meant that Koninenko and Chube, who had launched on MS-24, would now stay on the station for over a year, and this allowed Koninenko to claim the title of most days in space ever. And he absolutely shattered that record, by the way. Back in February, he broke the previous record of 878 days and has now logged an impressive 1,110 days in space throughout his career. We also had the fourth flight of the Zhelong-3 rocket this week. Liftoff occurred on September 24th from the Dongfang Hong Tiangong Barge, a few kilometers off the coast of China. The rocket brought eight satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit, and among the passengers were a weather satellite and Earth observation satellites from different manufacturers. Later that day, another Chinese rocket performed its fourth mission. At 2333 UTC on September 24th, a Lijian-1 lifted off from the Zhou Chuan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried remote sensing satellites and weather satellites, delivering a total of five payloads into a sun-synchronous orbit. And on September 25th, Falcon 9 launched another Starlink mission from Vandenberg. This time, 13 direct-to-south satellites and 7 regular Starlink V2 mini-satellites were added to the constellation. With these, SpaceX has now sent a total of 7,062 satellites into orbit, of which 636 have re-entered and 6,138 have reached their operational orbit. The booster for this mission was B-1081, which flew for the 10th time. It successfully landed on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, marking the 10th successful landing since the landing failure back in August. Next, an H-2A launched from the Tanegashima Space Center in Japan. Liftoff occurred on September 26th at 5.24 Universal Time. The rocket deployed a radar reconnaissance satellite into low Earth orbit that will be used for both national defense and civil natural disaster monitoring. Notably, this was the penultimate H-2A to fly. The rocket is now superseded by the new H-3 rocket, which has already flown a few times. The core stage for the 50th and final H-2A flight rolled off the production line this week, and its flight is currently scheduled for around March of next year. And wrapping up this week, we should have had this week's fifth launch from China. Unfortunately, that launch was scheduled to lift off after this episode was recorded, so we'll cover it in detail in next week's Space Traffic Report. Going into next week, the launch of Crew-9 is scheduled to lift off on September 28th at 17.17 UTC. You probably remember that this dragon won't fly with the originally planned crew of four, rather with only two passengers instead, Nick Haig and Alexander Gorbanov. The two extra seats will eventually be occupied upon Dragon's return by Butch Wilmore and Sunita Williams, who both arrived at the International Space Station on board Starliner. This launch was originally scheduled for this week, but it was postponed due to Hurricane Helene. As of recording, there is currently a 55% chance of favorable weather predicted for the September 28th attempt. Another Falcon 9 is expected to launch from Vandenberg on September 30th. This will be the 20th launch for OneWeb. Coincidentally, it will also add 20 more internet satellites to the constellation. The 40-minute window opens at 6.49 Universal Time. And going into the month of October, we'll have a Starlink launch on October 2nd. The launch will be conducted from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. Liftoff is scheduled to take place during a four-hour window opening at 8.50 UTC. And closing out the week on October 4th, we'll have the second launch of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket. The main purpose for this flight is to certify the vehicle for National Security Space Launch missions. The three-hour window for this launch opens at 10 o'clock Universal Time. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.